Hi everybody, it has been a long time, I know, um, but as usual, I'm always busy doing this, that, and the other thing, so, um, I was honored when Pastor asked me to speak to you all about death and what happens when we die. Um, I'm going to do this in a little bit different style than I've done all the others. Of course, I'm still always going to be referring back to um, my teacher's notes, and that would be Pastor Arnold Murray of Shepherd's Chapel. Um, so the question Pastor asked me to address to you was, what happens when we die? So. I'm gonna probably be looking up some of this stuff, kind of trying to um, read it for you in scripture. So, and I've got my trusty laptop here. We'll Google some stuff. Um, so when I think of the answer to that question, um, I think of the passage and I have to wait for uh, okay, the um, laptop joke here. The passage that says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I'd like to make this great big long lecture on that, but really it's kind of pretty simple, you know. Um, it says, so we're going to be going to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And my book is already opened, so that shouldn't take me long to get. Okay, so... In chapter 5, verse 8, it says, We are confident, I say, and are willing to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So, when we die, first let me say, we have two bodies. We have a physical body, and we have a spiritual body. And when we die, our physical body returns back to the dust from whence it came. So, let's look up that scripture. Um, okay. So let's look up where in the Bible does it say we were made from Okay, so, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and it said, and it says, And God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed, into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul now the breath of life in the greek word the greek word for that is ruha ruha i'm going to probably say it wrong but i think you can find out where where it is i'm trying to get that from and maybe look it up for yourself and pronounce it learn how to pronounce that correctly but it's ruha 
or something of that nature. Okay, so we know Genesis chapter 2 says that we were formed by God out of the dust of the earth. And so when we die, our physical bodies return back to that dust. Now, we have a spiritual body that God breathed into us and gave us life. And that spiritual body goes back to the Father from when we came, from where we came from. It goes. So let me try to explain how I come to all that. Excuse me. I'm a little uh, tired. It's been a long day already. Okay. So I'm going to start reading in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Okay, and there's going to be some notes that I add in here. Okay, and I'll let you know when I'm doing that, when I'm reading the Bible and when there are actual notes. Okay. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. That's the words in the Bible, not mine. So, now let me explain that, hey? Then when, after the silver cord breaks, excuse me, <laughs> um, and the mind is brain dead and the body loses its life, and then the body, the dust, shall return to the earth as it was before it was formed. The spirit is the intellect of the soul that gives the soul its identity. This is not complicated. When the body dies and it goes to the grave, the physical body will never be used again, for the soul has returned to the Father, to God, who created it in the first place, because this is the promise of God. It should be what all Christians look forward to all the days of their lives. That is, the day that we will be with the Father and Jesus in heaven is not some distant time in the future. When man gets to the point of not being able to understand this promise that at death the soul goes immediately to the Father, then he forms his religious man-made ideas and sidesteps what God's word teaches. Friend, it, come, it takes only a short time for the body to decay, but there is no mm, body there to resurrect. The body returns to dirt that it is made of, and the soul departs from the body, never to return to it again. God creates the flesh for your soul to occupy, and he places your spirit within your soul. That is what gives your soul its identity. Then just as God gave it for a brief time, he will take back your soul to himself. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 8 reads, Vanities of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vain. Oh, again, I apologize. Right now, it's the middle of the day here, and it's been a long day, and I've got a long day to go still. Um, this is a conclusion from the entire book of Ecclesiastes. As far as the flesh is concerned, it returns back to the form and the elements that it is made out of. Ecclesiastes 12.9 and moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The good teacher taught good proverbs, 
or teaching and knowledge from the Word of God to where the words came to life for the listener. This is what wisdom is, to take something complicated and make it understandable. And I really hope that's what I do for you. Ecclesiastes 12.10, the preacher sought to find out acceptable words and that which was written was upright, even the words of truth. In other words, the only authority for the preacher, the acceptable words were the truth within the God's Holy Spirit. God is the only good and upright. Don't study man's traditions but stay with God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. This is how a preacher is to preach. Friend, why reach your time on so-called critic, waste your time on so-called critics and shortcuts instead of going to the original source? So now in Ecclesiastes 12, 11, the words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies which are given from one shepherd. A goad is a stick with a sharp point on the end of it so that you can punch people with. Keep this verse in order in your thoughts. There is only one shepherd and Jesus Christ is that shepherd. The shepherd is the living word those words are Christ, should be a goad to the wise, for they are what the wise person is led by in his life. We are to fasten all our attentions to the wisdom of God's word. Ecclesiastes 12.12 12. And further, by these my son, be admonished of making many books, there is no end, and much study, is a weariness of the flesh. So what he means by this is, by these, by the words of God, we are to be admonished and directed in our way. The writing of books are endless. However, there is only one book that should be our focus. That is the Bible. Most of the other book is nothing but nonsense. We are to stay with the shepherd. You know, it's funny that um, we're reading that because I love books. I always have. I've always, you know, even when I traveled, I would be traveling with these large boxes like the size of a person. And I would be traveling through bus stations and airports. And I would be always traveling with these books and these magazines. And... The funny thing is, is, is that I never really read them um, because I always told myself this. When I'm finished with the Bible, then I will, um, then I will start reading the other books. But until that time, I'm just sticking with the Bible for now. So on that note, we will continue back in Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of men. To fear God is to revere God, to love and worship him. The only duty you have to God or man is to keep God's commandments and conduct your life in the manner laid out in the words of God. When you take in all God's word, there just isn't enough time for many of the books. And I can tell you that is the truth. I'll start another book and I'll get maybe into a chapter or two. And then I'm like, you know what? I really, I, I haven't, I need to read the Bible, all of it. And I need to read it over and over again so that I understand it completely. Um, 1214 Ecclesiastes. For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So to understand that, 
Everything that you do in this flesh body is recorded in God's book in heaven. And thank God we have repentance. When we love the Lord and do wrong, we will bring it to the Lord in private and repent to the Father in Jesus' name. And he has promised that by the blood of Jesus, all our sins would be forgiven. That is why it is important to understand the freedom you have in Christ through your preacher or family would like to keep your sins before your eyes. God says that when you have repent, repented, put it out of your life and forget it. He has. Your good works are important, and that is the only thing that you can take with you into eternity. Each of your works that are done for the Lord are already recorded where it matters, in heaven. This is what the garment that you will wear in eternity is made of your works. So it is time to get working for the Lord. Your good works by you reward in eternity so they will stay with you. Now, I remember when I would hear that and it would say good works, and I would be like, oh, do I even have any good works? What are they? And I've learned that good works are the things that we do naturally out of the kindness of our heart, not because we're trying to earn points or anything like that, but because it's in our heart and we just want to help other people. Like, for example, my neighbor's husband recently passed away, and she was always the one working, and he stayed home and took care of the house. So now that he's gone, she's still working, but doesn't have time to take care of her house, like mow her lawn and stuff like that, as well as she wasn't the cook in the house. He used to cook all her meals. So when I cook um, and I have a little extra, I'll, I'll always bring that over to her. Um, just, and I don't want any money because she's asked me, oh, well, I'll give you some money for this and I'll give you for my, some money for that. And, and I don't want her money. I just do it because I want to. And that's all that really matters, you know. Um, she's going through tough times and anything that I can do to help her in her hardship is what's in my heart to do. Okay, so now we're going to switch over to 1 Thessalonians because in 1 Thessalonians, um, Paul is telling the Thessalonians not to be confused about his first letter, uh, which was in chapter 3 of the 1 Thessalonians because the people didn't understand and so he's like, okay, let me try to explain this to you again. And this again talks about where the dead are. Okay, so we're going to pick it up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye not sorrow, even as others which have no hope. Now, let me just explain here, okay? The next five verses lay out, lay the foundation for what is called a rapture theory, which is not true. This is all that it is. It's a theory. It's an unproven idea. As we study our Father's Word, set aside these preconceived ideas you have about a rapture. And let's see what Paul is trying to tell the Thessalonians. It is from these verses that the rapture theory was born. Let's see how willing you are to bet your soul on it when we take a fresh look at what Paul is really seeing because that is what you are doing when you rely on it in these last days. So after Paul told the Thessalonians to live right in the community and to search their souls for sin in their lives, 
they were uh, that they then they were to repent of any sin. Paul moves next to what happens when death comes to this flesh body. This topic is important to Paul for it is the stabilizing factor of a Christian life. It removes fear that comes from the unknown of one's death. Paul gives this information for one reason, that is that we are not to be ignorant as the heathen. And the heathen means those without God, and those without God are those without hope. In other words, Paul doesn't want Christians to be stupid. This concern is over them which are asleep. The concern is over the loved ones that have died and left them, and their decaying bodies are out there in their graves. Paul is saying for us to not be sorry about those Christians who are dead and gone, for that concern of that is a concern of the heathens because they don't know better. The heathens' fear comes from their ignorance of God's word and his promises. The heathen have no hope, for they believe it is over at burial. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14. For if, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus God will bring with him. If we so I'm gonna explain this now. If we believe as Christians that Christ set examples for us so that we follow as he did in dying and raising again, then to sleep is to be dead from the flesh body. The Greek is a simple language for its structure allows one to be more precise. The subject in the frame of this verse, that ye not be ignorant as where are the dead. If you're a Christian, you know and believe that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and on the third day rose and came out of the tomb. If you do not believe this, Paul classifies you as ignorant and heathen, a non-believer. It is on the fourth day that he ascended back to his father. When Jesus ascended into heaven, all the souls went with him into heaven also that had passed on up to that point. So anybody that died before Christ died when Jesus died, he brought them all to heaven with him. That is the word of God, not man. Listen to God, not man. The souls of some went to wait for the time of judgment. Okay, so there's a gulf. And I'm not going to probably have time to find out where that scripture is. But there's a gulf. I've read where it says in the scripture. It's a little hard to understand. But basically what it says is that, so when all these people go to heaven, the good, bad, and the ugly, okay, there's going to be a gulf. And on one side is where those who are waiting for judgment. And on the other side, those that have past the first death that our, their, their soul is still living. Okay? So your first death is the death of the flesh. Your second death is the death of the soul. Okay, so, so those that have suffered a first death um, went up with him. Hold on. 